Welcome eighth graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. We wish you could be here in person this afternoon, but since you can't be here, we're going to do our best to make you feel like you're here, or maybe not so much here, but the universe, feel like you're in the universe um, during our virtual field trip this afternoon. If you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash 6-8 registration to get yourself or your class registered for this virtual field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. And like I mentioned a minute ago, um, this afternoon's virtual field trip is going to be about the components of the universe. During this virtual field trip, students will describe components of the universe, recognize that the sun is a medium-sized star located in a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, and that the sun is many thousands of times closer to Earth than any other star, and identify how different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum are used to gain information about components in the universe. So we're going to start off by exploring some different components of the universe with Mr. Monroe. Next, we're going to look at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, also known as the HR diagram with Ms. Schramm. Then we are going to explore the sun with Mr. Mirez. And last but not least, we're going to explore the electromagnetic spectrum, also known as the EM spectrum, with Mr. Dominguez. While we're doing all of that, if you have any questions for us, you can ask those at www.tiny.cc slash question dash answer. It's a super short form that you can fill out for us to submit any questions you have. You can ask as many questions as you like, and we will do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let me stop sharing my screen here and turn things over to Mr. Monroe, who's going to get us started off with components of the universe. Good afternoon, students. My name is it's Mr. Monroe, and we're going to be looking into the components of the universe. What makes up the universe? You know, stepping out and looking up at the night sky, of course, we see all the different stars that are available in the immediate area that we can actually observe. Them. But it is much more than that. And that's what we're going to be looking into. Now, at the end of my presentation, I'm hoping that you guys will be able to describe at least five components of the universe. Now, also, you know, there's been a little talk about nebulas and uh, galaxies, and there is a difference. So I want you guys to be able to recognize the difference between a nebula or actually a galaxy. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys, and we're going to get started, all right? Bear with me while I get it loaded up. What makes up the universe? Hmm. You know, we're going to start out with a local community as if I, uh, yeah, that's what I would call it. Earth is one of eight planets that orbit our sun, which is a star. You guys know all about this, right? A star is a large celestial body that is composed of gas and it emits light and heat energy. Stars are grouped together in structures known as galaxies. A galaxy is a large collection of stars, gas, and dust. What makes the universe types of galaxies? We have bar, barred spiral, irregular spiral, elliptical, and, and we also have uh, lenticular. There are uh, an estimated 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Wow. We don't really see all of that, do we? The universe is space and all the matter and energy in it. What makes the universe? Well, we are very fortunate to live on the planet Earth. Earth is a special place because it has just the right combination of conditions to support life. The presence of air and water supports the growth and development of plants and animals. Now, we also have the atmosphere that protects us from the dangerous ultraviolet rays coming from the sun. 
And here's the uh, image that shows the different layers of our atmosphere. And of course, we know that the ozone layer absorbs those ultraviolet rays that would ordinarily be dangerous to life on our planet. And that's just another image that shows what is consisting of what is consistent with the ozone layer. The solar system is the collection of large and small bodies that orbit our central star, the sun. And that's what we call our solar system, a very small part of the galaxy that we belong to. The solar system has eight bodies called planets, which are generally larger than the other bodies. A planet is a spherical body that orbits the sun. The four planets that orbit nearest the sun are called terrestrial planets. Terrestrial planets are Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth, and Mars. Terrestrial planets are rocky, dense, and relatively small. And then we have the four planets that are orbit the furthest from the sun. They are called gas giants. The gas giant planets are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The gas giant planets have thick gaseous atmospheres, small rocky cores, and ring system of ice and rock and dust. Orbiting most of the planets are small bodies called moons. Earth has only one moon, but Jupiter has more than 60. Wow. And there are some of the names of some of those. Mm, mm, mm. The solar system has other small bodies, including dwarf planets, comets, asteroids, and meteoroids. Altogether, there are up to a trillion small bodies in just our solar system. A star is a large celestial body that is composed of gas and emits light. Most stars are composed almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. The life cycle of a star, and this is very important that you pay attention to this because this is where the discussion about nebula, nebulas come in. As you can see, the life cycle of, star, of, of a star involves two different types of nebulas a planetary and a stellar. Now, somewhere in there, the stellar is going to develop into a stable stage star, okay? And then here we have it on the decline as the star may be dying and eventually is going to become a planetary nebula. But on the other hand, stellar nebulas don't necessarily have to take this route. They may take this route and become a massive star. And then they become a red supergiant. And then all of a sudden, there's a big chain, supernova. And then from that, we end up having a neutron star or eventually maybe a black hole. Energy is produced in the core of the star by the process of nuclear fusion. Energy escapes in the form of light, other forms of radiation, heat, and wind. Stars range in size from about the size of Earth to as much as 1,000 times the size of the sun. Boy, that's, ooh, that's huge. Planets are either rocky or made up of <clears throat> gas, Stars are composed of mainly helium and hydrogen gases. What makes up the universe? A galaxy is a large collection of stars, gas and dust held together by that tremendous force of gravity. Small galaxies called dwarf galaxies may contain a few billion stars. 
Wow. Giant galaxies may contain hundreds of billions of stars. Can you imagine that? Wow. Our solar system is located in the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way is classified as a spiral galaxy. What makes up the universe? Wow, these galaxies. Spiral galaxies are shaped like pinwheels. They have a central bulge from which two or more spiral arms are extended. Elliptical galaxies look like spheres or ovals and do not have spiral arms. What makes up the universe? Lots of stuff. Irregular galaxies appear as splotchy, irregularly shaped blobs. They are very active areas of star formation. How are the distance in the universe measured? Wow, the distance is so great. The distance between most objects in the universe are so large that astronomers measure distance using the speed of light, which is tremendously fast. A light year is the distance that light travels through space in one year. Light travels through space at about 300,000 kilometers per second, or about 9.5 trillion kilometers in one year. The distance to the sun, it takes about 8.3 minutes. The distance to Alpha Centauri, 4.4 light years. The distance to Hercules Globular, which is M13, 25,000 light years, wow. And the distance from Earth to the Andromeda Galaxy, wow, 2.5 million light years. Not in my life. Throughout the universe, there are areas where galaxies are densely con concentrated. These areas are called clusters or superclusters. What is the structure of the universe? Clusters contain as many as several thousand galaxies. Wow, can you imagine that? Remember how many stars might be found in a galaxy? Superclusters can be made up of 10 or more clusters of galaxies. The universe also contains huge spherical areas where there are very little matter exists. These areas are called voids. Astronomers have begun to think that the universe as having a structure similar to soap bubbles. Clusters and superclusters are located along these thin bubbles, bubble walls. The interior of the bubbles are voids. And it takes light year, light hundreds of millions of years to cross those largest voids. Well, I hope I've been able to help you learn a little bit about the structure of our universe. It's amazing that we are so tiny in this enormous thing that we call the universe. So I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Barton. So if any of you have any questions, I bet he can answer them for you. I want you guys to have a good day and enjoy the rest of your virtual field trip. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. The question that came in was, what is an exoplanet? And an exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star that is not our sun. Um, and we have, uh, well, not we, uh, but scientists have discovered about 5,000 exoplanets in the universe, and they will keep discovering more, I'm sure, as technology improves. All right, now we are going to explore the Hertzsprung Russell diagram with Ms. Schramm. Hey everybody, I'm Ms. Schramm, and we are talking all about the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. Dear goodness. <laughs> okay, so, all right, so at the end of my little section, you'll be able to use a Hertzsprung Russell diagram or a HR diagram to help you classify stars. And there's me on Halloween. Okay, so let's observe the stars. This is going to be our two essential questions today. What does the Hertzsprung Russell diagram show? And what are the four main regions of the HR diagram? 
All right, so first I want you to look at this picture of um, a bunch of stars. So how many colors do you see? And of course I cannot hear you shouting them out, but hopefully you are seeing white, you're seeing yellow, orange, red, and blue. So stars can be um, different colors and their temperature um, dictates what color they appear to be. So this is the spectral class. So that picture before is definitely enhanced to show more of the color. Um, so you could see the difference, but here is a spectral class. So depending on the temperature um, measured in Kelvins, because stars get so, 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 so hot, we use Kelvins. And depending on the temperature, it changes class and what color they appear to be. So the coolest stars are class M and they appear to be red. Then we have K, which appears to be orange, G, yellow. We've got F, that's white. And then you start to get um, more into a deeper blue. So the O class of stars are the bluest and they are the hottest. So just like when you look at a um, campfire, um, a lot of times we think of red as being the hottest, but when you look at the campfire, the hottest parts are actually blue. So the way we have our um, sinks and everything labeled with red and blue for stars, it's the opposite. So red is cooler and blue is hotter. But that's not the only thing that we're gonna talk about today is not just the color of the stars or the surface temperature. We're also gonna talk about the heat that they give off. So I'm gonna use my campfire example. And a campfire can reach 1,650 degrees. So that is hot as it can get in the uh, campfire. But then we also have a compost bin or a big compost pile. And the temperature in a compost pile can be 160 degrees Fahrenheit. So the molecules in that fire are moving much, much faster. It's reaching significantly higher temperatures and it's giving off um, heat really, really quickly. But the compost pile is the molecules are not moving as fast. It's giving off heat, but it's giving off heat more slowly. But what happens if the compost pile was huge, say several city blocks, and it was huge and huge and huge and huge, but then the campfire is still the same size. So which one would be giving off more heat? Now remember the fire is giving off heat because it's burning at a higher temperature, but if the compost pile is large enough, it starts to give off more heat total. So this will kind of help us um, as we look at different um, temperatures of the stars and how much uh, energy output they put. So thermal, thermal energy and luminosity. So luminosity is how brightly something shines and thermal energy is just Obviously, we're talking about heat, right? So some uh, heat energy that stars give off. So here we've got our sun. And our sun has a surface temperature of 5,778 kelvins. And its luminosity is a level one. So that's what we're going to use today. So that is our sun. Now we're going to compare it to another star called Betelgeuse. And you can already see our star is yellow and Betelgeuse is red. So Betelgeuse's temperature is um, 3,300 kelvins and its luminosity is 120,000 uh, L. So I want you to think about that for a second. Why is the luminosity so much higher for Betelgeuse? And even though the surface temperature is much cooler, so why do you think Betelgeuse has such a higher luminosity when its temperature is so much cooler? Now, if you want to pause the video and talk about that, um, go ahead and do that, teachers. But otherwise, I'm going to keep moving on since I can't discuss it with you. So Betelgeuse is much more luminous, but remember what we said about that compost pile compared to the campfire. Consider our campfire or our sun to be like the campfire and Betelgeuse is like a giant compost pile. It's not burning as hot, but it's much, much bigger. So here's kind of a fuzzy, but um, accurate, more size comparison. So you can see our sun is this tiny little dot 
And beetle guys is absolutely huge. So it doesn't burn as hot, but it is much, much larger. So it is giving off more heat and more thermal energy. So that makes it more luminous. So um, this is the diameter of the sun, 865,370 um, miles diameter. And Betelgeuse is 383.4 million miles diameter. So that is a huge size difference. So now we're finally at the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. So the diagram looks at two factors um, where to place the stars on the diagram. So on the left, we have the luminosity. And so it's compared to the sun. So this is like zero would be like, or one is where the sun is. So luminosity is how brightly they shine. And then on the bottom is surface temperature. So we've got our luminosity on the side and then surface temperature. And um, this one, I think it has it in degrees. It should be degrees Kelvin. Um, so if we look here, our sun is right in the middle. And our beetle guys, which we discussed a little bit ago, would be up here in the super giants, right? Because it's more luminous, um, but it does have a lower surface temperature. So it's over here. Now, there are four uh, main regions or groups of stars starting down here um, with the white dwarfs. Then through the middle is the main, uh, main sequence. Then we have the giants and the super giants. And those are our main um, categories for classification of stars. So our sun, as you can see right here, is a main sequence star. And Betelgeuse is up here with the super giants. So um, looking at this picture, sorry, it's a little blurry, but I want you to look at this picture and see how many single stars you can see. So I wish I could hear your responses right now, but just take a second and see if you can count how many single stars you see. Once again, this is a good pausing time, but for the sake of our field trip, I'm gonna keep going. So you should see probably only like two, maybe three. Um, the rest are actually galaxies. So if you look, here you can see this star, it's got the light coming off of it. Kind of looks like how you would draw like maybe a cartoon star. It's got those light rays coming out. So I see one, two, and three. The rest are um, galaxies or star clusters. So this is just to point out how big our universe actually is and how many stars are actually out there. And how can we study the stars? Well, these are two um, telescopes that have really helped us see into deep space. Well, one has already. So the Hubble Space Telescope um, that launched in 1990, and then the James Webb Space Telescope that launched in December, 2021. So the pictures from this one are coming out this summer or are expected to come back to us this summer. But um, if you're interested, of course, it's going to take 300 years to load while I'm sharing my screen. Um, but on NASA's website, you can see um, space images from Hubble Space Telescope and how deep into space it's been able to see. So I think those are always really fun to look at. So those are actual pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And then right now, like I said, its first images have not returned yet because the James Webb went into space in December of this year, but you can see um, more images of what the space telescope looks like um, and kind of get updates if you wanna follow along um, on NASA's website with that. So why is this important? So these telescopes and the reason I bring it up in relation to the stars and their classification is because these telescopes help us look into the past of the universe and help us learn about star life cycles, the formation of stars, um, and what else is going on in the universe. So that first telescope I showed you, the Hubble that was launched in 1990, it's able to see this far back 
um, in the age of universe and billions of years. So it goes way, way back in time. And the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to see further back in time to see when the first galaxies and the first stars were formed. So it's really interesting stuff. Um, I recommend looking up, looking it up if you're interested in astronomy at all. All right. So my challenge questions for you. What are the two factors of the Hertzberg-Russell diagram? So what were those factors on the bottom and the side? And what type of star is our sun? All right, that's all I have for you today. Uh, thank you so much, and I can't wait to see you next time. Thank you, Ms. Schramm. The uh, question that came up was, why do scientists use OBAFGKM um, for the, the stellar spectral types? Uh, they, you, and back in the 1800s, when they first started classifying stars, they started with A and then went B, C, D. Um, but over the years, um, they consolidated some groups into just those letters that I, that I just mentioned, and also put them in a different order um, based on new information they've gained about the stars. All right, now we're going to go more into depth of, into my favorite star, which is the sun with Mr. Ramirez. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about the sun. Before we do that, though, I do want to show you guys an animal friend, because after all, without the sun, which is the star, uh, we wouldn't have life on Earth. So we are exactly located in just the right spot um, that the sun is able to provide us with the heat that we need, the light that we need, and also uh, solar energy. So I have an animal friend with us today. This is Pelota. She's a ball python. And the sun is very important for her uh, because without the sun, she wouldn't be able to maintain her body temperature. It would be too cold. So reptiles are cold-blooded or ectothermic. Uh, so they cannot maintain their body temperature. They are dependent on the outside temperature and they really need that sun to help them stay warm. So during the summertime, you'll start to see uh, all the reptiles out basking underneath the sun. Uh, to soak in that heat. So I'm gonna go ahead and put our animal friend up and we'll start our presentation on the sun. And just to put it into perspective, if the earth were the size of this dime, the sun would be the size of a doorway. So if you look at the doorway in your classroom, imagine that to be the size of the sun, then earth would be the size of a dime. So the sun is 109 times larger than planet earth. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. I do have a couple of focus questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is how big is the sun compared to other stars? And the second is how far away is our sun from earth? So keep those questions in mind as we go through the presentation. So I'm gonna show you guys a quick little video and we're gonna to introduce to you guys the size and location of the sun. So where is our sun located? So again, notice that our sun is just a star. As you learned earlier, it's a mid-sized main sequence yellow dwarf star composed of hydrogen and helium gases. So if you take a look at this little image, this is the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, of course, that's where we live. Where do you think the sun is located in the Milky Way galaxy? So we know that our sun was born about 4.5, 4.6 million years ago from a giant rotating cloud of gas and dust. And our sun is located in the Orion spur of the Milky Way. It is near the edge of the galaxy. So now think about how far away is our sun from planet Earth. So go ahead and make your guess. We know that it is about 93 million miles away or 150 million kilometers, or we can also say 93 million miles away. So all of those are correct terms for how far away the sun is from planet Earth. And it is uh, the closest star to us. So how far away is the sun compared to other stars? So you learned earlier with Mr. Monroe that a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. 
And we learned that that's about 300,000 kilometers per second. So a light year is a measurement of distance. Now here is our sun right over here. The sun is about 8.3 light minutes from planet Earth. So again, that's a distance. And it is many, many times closer than any other star. So if you look at this map, here's our sun. We know that the next closest star is Proxima Centauri and it's about 4.3 light years away. So that's quite a distance. And then you can see even further out, we have uh, Centauri and then we have some other stars way, way, way out there. So our sun is the closest star to us. And then the next closest one would be Proxima Centauri. And that kind of makes sense because Proxima means close, right? In close proximity. So let's talk about size. So how many Earths do you think can fit inside the sun? You can go ahead and make a guess. And I tell you, it's uh, quite a lot. Now, I was talking about uh, Proxima Centauri earlier. Our fastest spacecraft, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Our, our fastest spacecraft, uh, Voyager 1, travels at about 17 kilometers per second. It would take 70,000 years uh, for us to reach Proxima Centauri. So that's a super long time. Um, now, continuing on with how many Earths would fit inside the sun. It's quite a lot. It's over 1 million. It's about 1.3 million to be exact. So the sun is massive. Uh, the sun is so massive that it makes up most of the mass in our solar system. So about 99.8% of the solar system's mass is the sun. Uh, so it is uh, quite massive. And then the next thing we're gonna talk about is how the sun compares to other stars. So if we look at this little diagram here, here's our sun. There's lots of other smaller stars, but then look at these huge stars. Uh, so here we have uh, Pollux right over here. We have Cirrus, Rigel, which is in Orion, and Aldebaran. And then I'm not entirely sure how to say this one anymore. I always called it Betelgeuse, uh, but you can see compared to all the other ones, uh, that Betelgeuse is a super big star. So the sun is not the largest star. It only looks large because it's the one that's closest to us. There are many, many other stars that are thousand times larger than our sun. And we're going to look at some other little uh, videos that help us to relate just how big other stars are. So here's a little uh, video. There's Earth. There's Kepler 20b. It's an exoplanet. And then coming up, we're going to see Neptune. So you can see that some of these objects are getting bigger and bigger. There's Uranus. This is, again, a size comparison. There's Saturn. Then we have our most massive planet coming up, Jupiter. Then we have a star. There's Proxima Centauri. You remember, that's the next closest star other than our sun. And then coming up, we're actually going to have our sun. So the sun is so much bigger then Proxima Centauri. And then there's our sun. And there's stars that are even bigger than the sun. We learned that earlier. So there's a Sirius. It's a binary star, and then it's the brightest star. Then we have Vega, which is even bigger. And then we have these massive stars like Arcturus. And it just keeps on going. So the universe is a massive place. There's Rigel, which is in Orion. Again, uh, Betelgeuse, which is the second brightest star in Orion. There's Canis Major. And the simulation keeps on going. There are way more massive stars than just those. Something that you guys can explore, it's called the Scale of the Universe website. And there's the link uh, right over here. Uh, but this kind of puts into perspective just how big things in the solar system is. So you can see uh, there's like the size of Rhode Island. There's the size of California. Now we're moving on to bigger things like some of the moons of Jupiter. There's planet Earth. There's Cirrus B, Saturn. There is our sun. And now there are objects that are in space that are even bigger than the sun. 
So I encourage you guys to look at that little simulation on your own time. And then the last thing I wanna show you is a little project that you guys can do at school or at home. And it's to help you determine the diameter of the sun. So all you're gonna need is a piece of foil. You're gonna take a thumbtack and poke a hole in the middle of it. You're gonna need a sunny day, obviously, a ruler, and a pencil and a piece of paper. So all you're gonna do, let me pause it right here. Pick a nice sunny spot outside. Take your little piece of foil with your little uh, thumbtack hole in it and kind of put it over. There's another piece of paper that you're gonna just put on the ground. Your goal is to make a shadow of that dot. So let me forward it just a little bit. So there you go. I have my little shadow of my pinhole dot right here. All I'm gonna do is take a pencil and I'm gonna trace that little dot, that shadow that was made on the paper. Then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have a friend or somebody take a ruler or a measuring stick and you're gonna measure the distance from the paper to your foil. So you're gonna need that measurement. And then later on, you're also gonna to have to measure the diameter of that little hole uh, that you guys traced earlier. And then once you have those two things, you're gonna do a super simple math problem to help you guys figure out the diameter of the sun. Now, I know you guys can just look that information up, but it's much more uh, entertaining if you guys can figure it out for yourself. Uh, so here's the equation to help you guys find the sun's diameter. Uh, it's gonna be the diameter of the image on your paper divided by the distance between the paper and the pinhole foil is equal to the sun's diameter, which is what we're trying to solve for, over the distance between the sun and earth, which we know is about 150 million kilometers. So if you can solve this equation using the information that you get from conducting this experiment, that will give you the sun's diameter. And then, ooh, let me go to my last one. My explore activity for you guys is to visit this below website, Solar System Scope to explore the composition of the sun as well as other stars. Uh, so let me show you really quick what that looks like. Here it is, solar system scope. And if we zoom in, there's our sun right over here. And then you can see that it lists some of the other close stars next to us. And then you can zoom in and zoom out on this little um, website and you can explore the other stars in our uh, universe as well. The other one is how big is space? It's a BBC interactive. Um, you can explore this and you can pretend you're in this little rocket ship and just keep on going to see where things are in space and how far away they are. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys. I'm gonna stop my screen share and we'll give it back to Mr. Broughton to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mears. The question that came in was what type of energy does the sun provide us? And uh, like an elementary level answer would be light and heat energy, but there is more to it, except for that maybe Mr. Dominguez will get into that with his um, segment on the electromagnetic spectrum. So um, we'll hear from Mr. Dominguez. Hey guys, it's Mr. Dominguez. And in this portion of your virtual field trip, we are going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. As you can see, I'm outside enjoying all the wonderful sights our center has to offer. But I wouldn't be able to do so if my eyes were not fine-tuned to perceive a very small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. Now, you can think of the electromagnetic spectrum as a range of frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. Now, what kind of radiation am I talking about? Well, besides visible light, I'm talking about gamma radiation, x-rays, microwaves, there's a ton of different frequencies that the universe is constantly giving off and we are going to explore the rest of that electromagnetic spectrum today. You may already be familiar with some. So let's head back inside and let's get this presentation started. So who discovered the electromagnetic spectrum? Well, there are several scientists who can be credited with discovering the different uh, electromagnetic radiation that we know comprises the electromagnetic spectrum, but it was this guy right here, uh, Sir William Herschel, that first discovered something beyond visible light. So he discovered infrared light, 
Uh, and he did so by setting up a very simple experiment. So all he did, uh, well, all he wanted to know was what color of light, because at this point people knew that light was comprised of different colors. Um, and he simply wanted to know uh, which of these uh, colors carried the most heat. Now he placed a thermometer on each of the colors of the rainbow, uh, and he actually placed one outside uh, next to the red light uh, just as a control. And what he ended up discovering was that there was something giving off heat uh, and that was infrared light. So that was the first type of electromagnetic radiation that was discovered that was beyond the visible light that we uh, perceive. So all that Sir William Herschel wanted to know was which of these colors that comprise light gave off the most heat. During his experiment, he inadvertently discovered infrared light which would be the first electromagnetic radiation that was beyond the visible light that we knew. Uh, this would lead to the discovery of x-rays and all the other electromagnetic radiation that now fill the electromagnetic spectrum. Gamma rays would be the last to be discovered. All right, guys, so here are the seven different types of electromagnetic radiation. And we'll start talking over here on this side of the spectrum at the higher frequency and the higher energy level. And then we'll work our way down to this side of the spectrum where we have longer wavelengths and lower energy levels. Now, while we cannot perceive most of this spectrum, scientists have devised ways of using different types of electromagnetic radiation for different purposes that have made our lives significantly better. So we'll start off with gamma rays. So gamma rays are used in medicine for killing cancer cells. Now, their ability to knock electrons off of nuclei uh, is the reason doctors use gamma rays to kill cancer cells. So they basically uh, just uh, destroy the, the cells at a molecular level. Now, if you've ever broken a bone, you've been exposed to x-rays, Doctors need to see inside your body in order to figure out what bones you've broken uh, and what other things may be ailing you. Now, ultraviolet light happens to be my favorite type of electromagnetic radiation because reptiles use UVB light to properly absorb the nutrients they get from their food. Without uh, UVB light, I would not be able to keep reptiles in captivity. Visible light, without it, we would not see a thing. Infrared's pretty interesting. Uh, it transmits heat from sun, fires, and radiators. So I'm sure that you guys have seen infrared uh, vision. It, it, you are able to see that heat coming from uh, human bodies and other uh, things like fires. So that is infrared light. Now radio, excuse me, microwaves are used for cooking, uh, for radar, telephone, and other signals and radio waves are, are of course used to broadcast radio and television. So every single one of these wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum have some sort of use in our everyday lives. Another wonderful way that the electromagnetic spectrum has helped us is by giving us a better view of the deepest parts of the universe. Since we can only perceive visible light, uh, we have often been clouded by everything that space holds, nebulas, stars, galaxies. So all of those things uh, block our view. However, using electromagnetic radiation, we have been able to build telescopes that use radio waves and x-rays to peer into the deepest parts of space. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this portion of your virtual field trip. I'm going to leave you guys with a little fact about some snakes. Uh, I have here my ball python pretzel. And pretzel, like other pit vipers, have pit organs that are able to sense infrared light. And this is so they can better hunt uh, for their food. So they sense the heat of mice and other mammals. 
because they love those warm-blooded friends as meals. So guys, I hope you uh, have a wonderful day. Until next time. Thank you, Mr. Dominguez. The question that came in was, what type of light does that new James Webb telescope see? And it sees the infrared light, um, which is important because the telescope that was our best one before that was Hubble, but that only saw the visible spectrum of light. So now we're seeing a whole new part of the electromagnetic spectrum with that James Webb telescope. I'm gonna share my screen with you to do a quick recap of what we uh, did this afternoon. So again, this virtual field trip was titled Components of the Universe. Uh, during this virtual field trip, students described components of the universe, recognized the sun as a medium-sized star located in a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, and that the sun is many thousand times closer to Earth than any other star, and identified how different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum are used to gain information about components in the universe. So we started off by exploring different components of the universe with Mr. Monroe, Next, we explored the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram with Ms. Schramm. Then we explored the sun with Mr. Ramirez. And we just finished exploring the electromagnetic spectrum with Mr. Dominguez. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you time. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about components of the universe with us. We hope you enjoyed this virtual field trip and you can let us know whether you did or not by going to www.tiny.cc slash 6-8 feedback and filling out a short feedback form for us. We'll see you again next time um, with, for, eighth, for our next virtual field trip for eighth graders. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.